Hi guys! Welcome to another episode of Attorney Job Vlogger, Law for the Everyday Layman. Today we continue with our discussion on the Revised Corporation Code and today we'll talk about non-stock corporations and the special corporations, namely educational corporations and religious corporations which are composed of either the corporation soul or religious societies. Okay? So if you like my videos and you want to see more, please hit the subscribe button. Also, please remember that this is only for educational purposes and is not a substitute for proper legal advice or for studying and understanding the law. A like on this video or any of my other videos would also be greatly appreciated. Now, let's begin with non-stock corporation. Okay? A non-stock corporation is one where no part of its income is distributable as dividends to its members, trustees, or officers. If it receives income, you cannot distribute that as dividends, okay? Provided, of course, that if that non-stock corporation receives any profit incidental to its operations, that profit will be used for the furtherance of the purpose or purposes for which the corporation was organized, subject, of course, to the provisions of the Revised Corporation Code, okay? So, if the corporation earns money, that money or profit should only be used for the furtherance of its purposes. Now, to be a non-stock corporation, it should have it should not have capital stock divided into shares, and no part of its income during its existence should be distributed as dividends to its members, trustees, or officers. Okay, that's what makes it a non-stock corporation. So even if let's say there's a statement of capital. No, a statement of capital stock. Okay, it should not be divided into shares, and that is just a statement. Okay, the test is as long as there is no distribution distribution of retained earnings to its members, then the corporation is non-stock. Because the law says that any profit that the corporation, the non-stock corporation, may obtain as an incident to its operations shall be used in furtherance of the purpose or purposes for which it was organized. Okay? A non-stock corporation may not lawfully engage in any business activity for profit as it would run counter to its very nature as a non-profit entity. However, it may invest its accumulated funds for profit purposes. But to do so, such power must be included in the Articles of Incorporation. Otherwise, it will be an ultra vires act. And I talked about that in a pre previous episode. Okay? Now, the law gives us the purposes of uh, non-stock corporations. And they may be formed or organized for charitable, religious, educational, professional, cultural, fraternal, literary, scientific, social, civic service, or similar purposes like trade, industry, agricultural, and like chambers or any combination thereof subject to the special provisions governing particular classes of non-stock corporations, okay? Which I'll talk about later, no? Now, a stock corporation, no? An, as a corporation which is originally a stock corporation may be converted to a non-stock corporation. But a non-stock corporation cannot be converted to a stock corporation. To convert a stock corporation to a non-stock corporation, just amend the uh, Articles of Incorporation. And the effect is that the stockholders will now become members of the converted non-stock corporation. They will no longer have any pecuniary interest in the corporation, nor are they entitled to share in the profit that may be obtained from the operation of the non-stock corporation. But a non-stock corporation cannot be converted into a stock corporation because that would change the corporate nature from non-profit to monetary gain. Okay? Instead, the corporation should just be dissolved and the people should just form a new stock corporation. If the non-stock corporation is not dissolved and there is an attempt to convert it to a stock corporation, it will be tantamount to a distribution of its assets or income to its members because after the conversion, the assets of the non-stock corporation will now be treated as payment to the subscriptions of the members who will now become stockholders of the corporation. Take note 
that the rules that will apply in non-stock corporations are the specific provisions thereon in the Revised Corporation Code. But in case there is no specific rule, then the provisions governing stock corporations, when pertinent, may be applied to the non-stock corporation. So priority, you apply the provisions on non-stock corporations and supplementarily provisions on the stock corporations. So now let's take up the special rules that apply only to non-stock corporations. Just remember that no part of the income of non-stock corporations is distributable as dividends to its members and that a non-stock corporation cannot engage in business with the object of making profits. Now, in, in non-stock corporations, instead of stockholders, we have members. The right to vote of members may be limited, broadened, or even denied in the Articles of Incorporation or bylaws. And unless otherwise provided in the Articles or bylaws, then each member shall be entitled only to one vote in the election of trustees, unless cumulative voting is authorized in the Articles or bylaws. Now, voting may be done by proxy, and the bylaws may authorize uh, voting through remote communication and or in absentia. Okay? Membership and all rights arising therefrom are personal. Okay? Meaning they are non-transferable. You cannot transfer your membership unless it is otherwise provided in the articles or bylaws. And membership shall be terminated only in the manner and for the causes or reasons or grounds provided for in the articles or bylaws. Term what's the effect of termination? No? Termination of membership extinguishes all the rights of a member in the corporation or in its property unless, of course, otherwise provided in the articles or bylaws. Now, the corporation acts through its board, no? and in this case, board of trustees. The number of trustees, they, first the trustees, they must be members of the corporation. No? The number of trustees should be fixed in the articles or in the bylaws, and uh, the number may or may not be more than 15. Okay? May or may not. So, pwedeng sobra sa 15. Now, trustees shall hold office for not more than three years until their successors are elected and qualified. Take note that the staggering of terms under the old law is no longer required. Huh? If a trustee is elected to fill a vacancy occurring before the expiration of a particular term, then he shall hold office for the unexpired period. Okay? Now, there is a new requirement, no? The independent trustee who is required to be elected for non-stock corporations that are vested with public interest. Unlike the normal trustees who must be members of the non-stock corporations, the independent trustee is not required to be a member, okay? Now, Section 92 is also a new provision, no? Which requires that non-stock corporations, at all times, they should keep a list of its members and their proxies in the form that the SEC may require, which list shall be updated to reflect the members and proxies of record 20 days prior to the scheduled election. As to meetings, the bylaws may provide that the members of a non-stock corporation may hold their regular or special meetings at any place, even outside the place where the principal office of the corporation is located. Provided that, of course, proper notice is sent to all members in, uh, indicating the date, the time, and the place of the meeting. And, of course, the meeting should be held within the Philippines. Okay? Now, in case of dissolution of a non-stock corporation, its assets should be applied and distributed in accordance with the rules provided in Section 93. That's codal, no? And you can just read the order. But briefly, I'll give you the order, no? First, you pay the liabilities of the corporation. Then, you return assets which are held on a condition requiring return. 
Ibig sabihin, kung kailangan isoli, isoli mo. That's how easy it is. No? Third, assets which are held subject to limitations permitting use for charitable, religious, educational, and similar purposes but not subject to a condition to return shall be transferred to corporations performing substantially similar functions. Kunwari, the corporation is holding property that was allowed uh, they were allowed to hold it but uh, subject to the limitation that it should only be used for charitable purposes upon dissolution they should give it to another corporation who is performing substantially similar functions and finally other assets will be distributed according to the articles or bylaws if they provide this uh, if they provide for distribution to the members otherwise then uh, to other persons, societies, associations, organizations, or corporations, whether for profit or not. In which case, this should be specified in a plan of distribution of assets. No? And this plan should be adopted by resolution arrived at by majority vote of the Board of Trustees and approved by two-thirds of the members having voting rights at a meeting called for the purpose. So that's it for non-stop corporations. Let's go now to educational corporations or these are stock or non-stop corporations organized to provide facilities for teaching or instruction usually with a regular faculty and curriculum and with an organized body of students at the place where the educational activities are regularly carried on. Now, uh, educational corporations are governed by special laws and by the general provisions of the Revised Corporation Code. Take note that the current law deleted the section on prerequisites to incorporation under the old law. So presumably, that will no longer apply. No need to know it anymore. Okay. The only things left you have to know for purposes of corporation law no, for exams or whatever, no, are the rules on the Board of Trustees. And let's begin with non-stock educational corporations. Because again, educational corporations can be stock or non-stock. No? So for non-stock educational corporations, the number of trustees shall not be less than 5 nor more than 15. Unlike in regular non-stock corporations, they may be more than 15. In educational, they should not be more than 15 and they should be in multiples of 5 so either 5 10 or 15 okay next unless otherwise provided in the articles or bylaws the term of office of one-fifth of the number of trustees shall be staggered with a one-year interval the law says that the term of one-fifth of the trustees should expire every year okay that's staggering of terms. Next, trustees subsequently elected shall have a term of five years and if elected to fill vacancies occurring before expiration of a particular term, they will hold office only for the expired period. When the period expires, the trustee who is elected thereafter will hold office for five years. Next, a majority of the trustees shall constitute a quorum for the transaction of business. And finally, the powers and authority of trustees shall be defined in the bylaws. Okay? That's for non-stock corporations. Now, for stock educational corporations, the number and term of directors shall be governed by the provisions of the Revised Corporation Code on stock corporations. In other words, just follow the rules for stock corporations. But the requirement that the number of trustees in educational institutions shall be in multiples of five and the staggering system, those are mandatory, okay? Has to be in the in multiples of five and you should follow the staggering system. No, yung uh, uh, one-fifth of the number of trustees shall be staggered with a one-year interval, okay? Finally, take note under uh, section 174, uh, non-stock corporations or special corporations may, through their articles or bylaws, they may designate their governing boards by any name other than board of trustees. No? So they can call it whatever they want. Board of regents, board of whatever, okay? 
So uh, that's it for educational corporations. Now let's go to uh, religious corporations. No? Or these are corporations composed entirely of spiritual persons and which is erected which are erected for the furtherance of a religion or for perpetuating the rights of the church or for administration of the church or or uh, religious work or property. Now, uh, religious corporations are special corporations which should not be confused with the uh, ordinary non-stock corporations organized for religious purposes, okay? Religious corporations have their own rules found in sections 107 to 114 of the Revised Corporation Code and supplementarily by the general provisions of that same law on non-stock corporations, okay? Take note of the rule that special provisions prevail over general provisions, okay? If there's a special rule, you follow that special rule over the general rule, okay? So in this case, since the rules on religious corporations are special rules, they prevail over the general rules of non-stock corporations. Example, while generally non-stock corporations may have more than 15 trustees, Section 114 should prevail because it is a special rule and therefore the maximum trustees for religious societies is 15. Okay, that's an example. Now, under the Revised Corporation Code, religious corporations may be either a corporation sole or religious society. So let's talk about each, no? Let's begin with the corporation soul. A corporation soul is uh, may be incorporated by one person, no? and it consists of one member or corporator only and his successors. It may be uh, formed by the chief archbishop, bishop, priest, minister, rabbi, or other presiding elder of such religious denomination, sect, or church for the purpose of administering and managing as trustee take note of that huh? purpose of administering and managing as trustee the affairs property and temporalities of any religious denomination sect or church okay so uh to save time later in the discussion when i say archbishop etc that that's deemed to cover archbishop bishop priest minister rabbi or other presiding elder Okay, and when I say religious denomination, etc., that covers religious denomination, sect, church, etc. Okay, to make it quick. Now, the Articles of Incorporation of a Corporation Soul is not required to state the term for which it which it is to exist, no, even under the old law. But uh, now that doesn't matter anymore because under the Revised Corporation Code, just like regular corporations, corporation souls will have corporations so you know have perpetual existence as well now to be a corporation soul the chief archbishop etc of the religious denomination should file the articles the verify uh, the articles of incorporation verified by affidavit or affirmation no uh, of such chief archbishop with a copy of the commission certificate of election or letter of appointment okay he should file those documents with the sec stating that he represents the religious denomination which desires to become a corporation soul that the rules of the religious denomination are consistent with becoming a corporation soul and do not forbid it that he is charged with the administration of the temporalities and the management of the affairs, estate, and properties of the religious denomination described in the articles. It should also state the manner by which vacancy occurring in his office is required to be filled according to the rules, regulations, or discipline of the religious denomination the place where the principal office of the corporation soul is to be established and located which must be within the philippines and any other provisions not contrary to law for the regulation of the affairs of the corporation now again that's codal if you didn't, did not get that list don't worry just check the code okay it's just a list i just mentioned it for the sake of discussion now <coughs> excuse me <coughs> From and after the filing with the SEC of the documents I mentioned earlier, 
the chief archbishop, etc., no? shall become a corporation soul and all temporalities, estate, and properties of the religious denomination, theretofore administered or managed as such, uh, chief Archbishop shall now be person, personally held in trust as a corporation soul for the use, purpose, exclusive benefit on behalf of the religious denomination. Okay, so now that Chief Archbishop, he holds that property in trust. Okay, take note that Section 110 does not expressly require the approval of the SEC for the of the AOI no so uh, the as soon as the AOI and other documents are filed then the corporation soul is deemed uh, incorporated now a corporation soul may purchase and hold real estate and personal property for each church charitable benevolent or educational purposes and may receive bequests or gifts for such purposes however no Authority from the RTC and compliance with the procedure are required before it can mortgage or sell. Okay, because that involves disposition. Earlier, it, it, uh, he, the corporation soul just receives it, but now the corporation soul is attempting to dispose either through mortgage or sale. No, okay. So authority from the RTC and compliance with the procedure is required before the corporation soul can mortgage or sell real property but exception to the exception no, take note such authority is not necessary where the religious denomination etc represented by the corporation soul has rules which regulate the acquisition mortgage and selling of real and personal property in which case those rules will govern no so apparently what you can take away from this is that the assistance from the court is only necessary to make sure that the disposition is fair, that uh, no rights are being uh, trampled upon, no? <clears throat> but if there are rules to be followed, no? Then uh, court assistance is no longer necessary. Now, when it comes to filling vacancies, the successors in office of any chief archbishop, etc., no? Shall become the, the corporation sole upon the filing with the SEC of a notarized copy of their commission, certificate of election, or letters of appointment. In case of any vacancy in the office of the chief archbishop, etc., if the, uh, the, persons, no, the persons authorized by the rules of the religious denomination or church to administer the affairs of the corporation during the vacancy, shall exercise all the powers and authority of the corporation soul during such vacancy. In other words, while uh, the, the new corporation soul, the, the substitute has not yet been approved no, or recognized yet, then that uh, person allowed by the rules will continue to administer the property in case of a vacancy. Now, dissolution. A corporation soul may be dissolved voluntarily by filing for approval by the SEC a verified declaration of dissolution setting forth the name of the corporation, reason and authorization for dissolution, and names and addresses of persons who are to supervise the winding up of affairs of the corporation. And as soon as the SEC approves this, then the corporation shall be deemed dissolved except for the purposes of winding up. Okay, so that's it for a uh, corporation soul. Now let's go to a uh, religious society. Now a religious society is incorporated by an aggregate or a group of persons. And they may incorporate for the purpose of administering or managing its temporalities, affairs, and property. Unless it is forbidden by the rules of their society or by the constitution or by competent authority. The procedure requires a written consent or affirmative vote of two-thirds of the members at a meeting called for the purpose and filing of a verified articles of incorporation with the SEC setting forth the matters contained in section 114. Take note that approval by the SEC of the articles is not expressly required for the society to be incorporated. Okay, that's it for uh, religious societies. 
Now, finally, to end this episode, no? on the matter of religious corporations, just take note of the case of Long versus Basa, involving a religious corporation whose board had expelled certain members on purely spiritual or religious grounds since they refused to follow its teachings and doctrines. The controversy here centers on the legality of the expulsion. Now, the Supreme Court said that the basis of the relationship between a religious corporation and its members is the latter's absolute adherence to a common religious or spiritual belief. Once this basis ceases, no? or once this basis ends, membership in the re religious corporation must also cease or end. There is no room for dissension in a religious corporation and where a member is expelled for es espousing contrary doctrines, such action from the church is conclusive upon the civil courts. So in matters purely ecclesiastical, the decisions of the church tribunals are conclusive on the courts and the courts will not inquire into the correctness of the decisions of the ecclesiastical tribunals. The law leaves the matter of ecclesiastical discipline to the religious group concerned, which can be provided for in the articles or bylaws. Okay? So that's it for uh, my uh, episode on non-stock corporations, educational corporations, and religious corporations. I hope you may have picked up a thing or two, and I hope to see you next time, guys. See you soon. Bye.